try tippy toeing. This community of care is created through our work and our time together. Our commitment. Oh, we're doing special needs. Well, it didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it didn't start right away. Uh, let's go ahead then. Thank you. This special music, Shailene Watt, called Oceans. You call me out upon the Great unknown where feet may fail, and there I find you in the mystery in oceans deep. My faith will stand, and I will call upon your name. And keep my eyes above the waves When soul will rest upon your embrace For I am yours And you are mine Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't start now. And I will call on your name and keep my eyes above the waves my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine spirit lead me without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me and take me deeper than my feet could ever wander and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my savior spirit lead me where my trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me take me deeper than my feet could ever wander and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my savior spirit lead me where my trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me and take me deeper than my feet could ever wander and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my savior and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. My soul will 
rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Now, this community of care is created through our work and our time together, our commitment to one another. This is our covenant to walk together in loving fellowship, to share our hopes and values, as we pass these baskets, we thank you for your generous gifts, which support the work of this religious community and Unitarian Universalism in the world at large. As a reflection of our values, we are pleased to participate in the Change for Change program. The coins you place in the basket today will support the work of nonprofits in and around the Grand Valley. We will now receive today's offering. This congregation is a community of ourselves. Its energy and resources are our energy and resources. Its wealth is what we share. As we contribute to its life, we affirm our lives within it. I was just given one more announcement to remind you that we have this month's newsletters sitting in the back of the sanctuary in the kitchen area. So uh, they won't be mailed this month, but if you'd like to pick one up, uh, hard copy, please do so. They are stacked in the back alphabetically. Our hymn today is 
Number one, two, three in the gray hymnal, Spirit of Life. And now Kevin Watt will go ahead and give us uh, a talk today on honoring our needs. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I first wanted to just say a very sincere thank you for having us here. Uh, I don't know how special you all feel, but in our community, this is an incredibly special place. And in my work as a chaplain and just as a resident of the Grand Valley, this has been a place of great comfort. And just knowing that you're here or at times participating with you, um, you might know I benefit from the fact that you offer your, your space as a place for us chaplains to come train in what is called clinical pastoral um, ed education with Wendy as our teacher. It's a way that this spirit of inclusivity and welcome permeates out into the wider world because we learn here how to recognize and love our own needs, our own selves, and not have that muddle and confuse when we're caring for the needs of others. I also got to, to participate in your We Shelter program. Um, I've often seen many of, of you at the Catholic Outreach Soup Kitchen, um, the you know, Mutual Aid program. It's all just tremendous. So I just wanted to thank you because it's really quite an honor to come be here. Um, as my introduction said, I am a hospice and palliative care chaplain here with Hope West. Um, I work with uh, folks way out in Debec and Parachute and Rifle and Mesa and Colburn, and then with palliative care patients here in the Grand Valley. Um, but another aspect of my life, which I'm gonna share part of here, is that I also work in regenerative agriculture. I do writing and speaking and teaching on that topic. Um, my wife and I were farmers for, 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 for quite a long time. And these two things have really brought together for me a theology and an understanding of both growing and letting go, of expansion and allowing with compassion even for, for you know, contraction. And so, the topic that I wanted to, to speak on, which for most people is very alien, looking at your hymnal, looking at, at, at the words that, that you all share, this may not be very alien, but it's to honor our needs, us as individuals, to remember that we give and we serve, but also we are part of these larger uh, systems. And so before we dive in, it's my hope to kind of come back to part of the poem I, I had shared. There is a way of approaching the self without a heavy hand when the heart mind slowly becomes unburdened by its past, where the body listening with the whole of itself finally becomes attuned to all the subtle happenings in the realm not yet stained by the faithless world of man. 
So honoring our needs is an essential aspect of coming into contact, not only with our truest selves, but with our community, with our world, and even with the divine. Our needs are gifts. They are the key for creating sincere and loving relationships because they reveal to us opportunities that we never knew were possible. And they can help us also let go of relationships and patterns that no longer serve us. But we often hide from our needs because they make us vulnerable. They seemingly place us in the power of others or make us feel or appear weak. We may also be afraid to look at our needs because they are confusing. Our needs express themselves as not only words, but as intuitions, as images, as feelings. And coming back to, to, to that poem, we can yearn for things that we have never seen, but yet that we know. And that is incredibly difficult. And I have seen again and again that when we reject this small identity, this cultural programming, and we brave what may seem irrational, and we honor our needs, we can come into full and loving contact with life and open up to horizons of possibilities that we couldn't see when we were living in a small and constrained sense of self. You might know that wonderful quote that Albert Einstein has, that no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness it created. So remember, when we leave that realm of safety of what it, we feel is validated externally and is part of our patterns, we are also leaving the things that have been showing up while we're in that pattern too. And sometimes that's a blessing. So as you all, as your wonderful congregations explores expanding possibilities, I would say the best place to start is by honoring your own needs. So let's talk about needs. Needs are a sensitive, even a taboo topic in our culture, but it goes even further than just taboo. Some of you may know Dr. Marshall Rosenberg who wrote Nonviolent Communication. And he teaches that we not only have a culture, but a language which denies needs. Think for just a moment what it means if somebody calls you needy. What does that feel like? What's the first reaction that comes into your heart? Think about how you're feeling when you call somebody else needy. What's in your heart? Are you honoring them? Do you feel honored being needy? There is an implicit message there. You're asking too much. You are, you are too much of a burden. And yet, in this space, we reconnect with the fact that we are beloved children of this universe. We are worthy. And so there's a disconnect. So when we are taught that we are shameful or that we should be, filled with shame, that we are burdening others, when we are taught that the path to fulfilling a respectable life in this Western culture is to minimize our needs and maximize our strength, our status, our independence, our control, our, our, our domination, mastery, modesty, predictability, we are closing off a, a, a door to an essential part of us. In fact, it's ironic because it's even obvious in these different realms of, of, of life. You know, the birth of civilization, according to some anthropologists, comes from our needs. So you might know Margaret Mead. She's an incredible anthropologist and writer. And she was asked once by a graduate student at, at a symposium, what would you say is the earliest sign of civilization? Expecting is it a pot? Is it an arrowhead? Is it money? Is it story? And her answer, which still strikes me, is that it was a healed femur bone, which we found. So consider our femur. Well, I got a picture of the guy, but I've never in, figured out how to get sounds so I can tell what he's saying. 
you are going to have a very hard time hunting and gathering, <laughs> carrying your weight, being a productive member of your culture. So what does it mean to find one that has healed? It means that person wasn't left behind. It means that person was taken care of, regardless of the burden that they might have felt. They were told that they were worthy of, of love and life. And I, agree. I think that is the sign of civilization, of culture being born. But take a moment. Think about what you felt when you felt needy. That person who was being healed offered a gift too. That person gave an opportunity for that culture to form a, around, we do not leave people behind. We do not quantify your value. Need is also crucial for how we relate to the divine. And it even affects how we think about God or the universe or just love. Some of us are taught that hiding our needs is some kind of virtue instead of sharing our needs and meeting those of others. C.S. Lewis, if you ever have time, it's an incredible essay, but he starts his essay entitled The Weight of Glory with these words. If you asked 20 good men today what they thought the highest of the virtues, 19 of them would say unselfishness. But if you asked almost any of the great Christians of, of old, he would have said, love. You see what has happened? A negative term has been substituted for a positive. And this is more than a philological importance. The negative ideal of unselfishness carries with it the suggestion, not primarily of securing good things for others, but of going without them ourselves. As if our abstinence and not their happiness was the important point. I do not think that this is the Christian virtue of love. So needs are what connects us to each other and to our world. They create relationship by acknowledging not only commonality between us, but also vulnerability, where we can give each other the gift of satisfying each other's needs. There's actually wonderful research on this. So if you're moving, listen up very closely, that the fastest way to build community with your neighbors, to make friends, is to ask for a small to a medium-sized favor because you are inviting that. You are modeling, I can be vulnerable, which I think all of our hearts go, if they asked me, I could ask them next time. And that is an incredible lesson because there is bravery in honoring needs. There is gift. Needs are the basis of sincere love, both for others and for ourselves. Surprisingly, I, I, in my work as a chaplain in regenerative agriculture, teaching meditation, the thing that most people struggle with, in our culture, we would think, how do I offer compassion to others? People with different political views. I, that's actually really easy. <laughs> that, that takes maybe a couple classes. The one that takes a, a lifetime is loving ourselves. And it's a product not of individual failing, but of our culture. You might know the story way back, I think it was the 60s, maybe the, 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 the 70s, when meditation and Buddhism were coming to, to the Western world. The Dalai Lama was giving a talk and he had got a question from a young American saying, what do I do about self-hate? Sorry, it makes me tear up a little bit. And the Dalai Lama, spent, it's something like 12 to 15 minutes talking with his in interpreter because the concept of self-hate was so alien. What do you mean you hate yourself? Does he mean that he hates somebody else or he hates another religion? We can talk about that. But this idea of saying, what do you mean that you don't honor and love yourself? That's the beginning of everything. And yet for us, the beginning of our culture, is always minimize yourself. Unless you're aggrandizing, that's maybe okay if you have enough money. So let's just get basic. What are needs? A need in my own sort of language, there's no peer reviewed uh, sort of definition that I'll offer, but they're deep fundamental necessities that we all have 
we all have in order to feel safe, able to offer love, and able to thrive. I think it's best you kind of take time to find your own needs, but I'll offer there are some pre-existing sets that you can start with. We all know Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of, of needs. We have our physiological needs of air, water, food, shelter, rest, clothing, reproduction, safety needs, security, employment, resources, health, love and belonging, friendship, intimacy, family connection, esteem, respect, status, recognition, but we, we can look at it in many different ways because I, I, as I said, needs won't always show up as a flashcard, as a single item, as a checkbox. That's why I use that term honoring needs. Honor is not a purely rational, quantitative, linear process. Honor is something felt. Honor is something that we offer that doesn't have to earn it necessarily. It's something that, 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 that we give. And so we need to come into contact with needs in many different ways, because they're in our mind, they're in our heart, they're in our bodies. And often they may show up in ways you don't expect. You might have persistent, uncomfortable thoughts, feelings, sensations. These can point the way to unmet needs. And behind these strong, uncomfortable feelings, you might know them, anger, sorrow, we can find this wisdom. We can find what we are, we are yearning for. And there's an important difference that, that you need to understand though between needs and strategies. When your spouse tells you that they need you to do the dishes, they're not necessarily talking about a need around dishes. They are actually talking about a strategy. I need you to do something else. And the strategy is through the dishes. They could be saying that they need to live in a home that feels organized and healthy. They could be expressing that they need a partner who they feel is engaged and helps care for a shared home. Those are, are the needs. The dishes are, 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 are the strategy. There's an incredible marketer, and it's weird to say that in a church, but his name is Seth Godin. And he is the closest that I've seen where somebody goes all the way to the material and comes back to the spiritual. And he has an example about selling a quarter inch drill bit. And he says, the person buying that quarter inch drill bit doesn't actually want a quarter inch drill bit. They want a quarter inch hole. <laughs> but they may not want just a quarter inch hole. They want a place to affix a bookshelf onto to their wall. And in fact, they may not want just the bookshelf. What they might need is the sense of peace in their home by having it organized. Or maybe they need to let their spouse know that they respect their needs and that they love them. So we can get focused on the drill bit, or we can let ourselves come all the way back down to what the real need is. And just imagine how differently these conversations go if you had focused on strategies. Honey, I'll do the dishes later. <laughs> like, oh, that's not quite what she's asking for. Or no, this drill bit or the titanium drill bit. Like, it's not about that. And so when we miss these opportunities, we miss the, the chance to come deeper into ourselves and deeper into relationship with the world. So take just a moment now in your own mind to think of, of, of an example of how it felt when somebody or when yourself focused on strategies and not on needs. For me, it's a missed opportunity. It feels foolish. It feels like that's not what they were asking for. Maybe they knew it. Often they don't. And that's one of the other gifts is as you get good at understanding you, your own needs, you recognize others and you can help them too. That's why they're, they're sacred gifts. That's why vulnerability is so important because it brings that connection. So I have a story from my chaplain time or my time as a chaplain. I had a patient named Robert. Of course, in case you all know, all these names are changed and every, <laughs> but 
you know, Robert had a long history of being in control, highly competent, the kind of person who was always taking care of others, never asking for anything. But he got a rare and aggressive disease that caused immense pain and put him through those exhausting uh, cycles of elation and hope, and then the despair as experimental treatments that they hoped would work failed. And he could accept a lot in life with grace. He was an avid meditator, was just great un under pressure. But in this instance, he had this really uncontrollable anger and fear about death. And it made his pain worse. And it was hurting his relationships as he was closing off. And his family, who he was incredibly close to, were just puzzled by, is this what the dying process is going to do? This is confusing and this is heartbreaking. So over time, Robert and I could build a rapport and build trust, could open up to this sort of vulnerability. And he felt safe to explore what was behind that fear and that anger, what it was from his past that had that deep-seated need that he couldn't quite have met, he couldn't say. It turned out that trauma and pain and his culture had buried the, the need to be cared for, to be vulnerable deep, deep down. And that caused terror, it caused constriction, it caused pushing away his family. But as we worked through this and as he found ways to express it, it was incredible. His family celebrated. So he, of course, is terrified. If I'm not the person who gets it all done, who am I? And his family responded, you are the person who we get to care for. You are giving us the gift of finally being there for you. And their relationship, which was already fantastic, deepened and got better and got more, more loving. And the pain that had racked him, that he was so worried would ruin his death and make it gross and difficult, relaxed in the final days. And sometimes as part of my own grieving process, I'll write a death poem for people who I work with. And this is Robert's. Do not wash my corpse. Sorrow, pain, and embarrassment have scrubbed me clean. Again, I am like a newborn, unashamed to wail and to yearn with my whole heart to be held by the tender love that gave me life. That peace was only possible through his needs. I've also seen it work in, in, in the living world, in regenerative ag agriculture. Some of you may know it's a form of agriculture where we really try and work with it with the natural world, understand what's going on here. What are the dynamics? What does this piece of, of land or ecosystem need? What do I need? What are the human needs? And to break that old story that the needs of people and, and planet are somehow at odds. And what's incredible is similar to Robert's story by entering into that act of trust and faith by saying, my needs matter for healthy food, for a good and uh, living wage, but I also need a stable climate. <laughs> I also need beautiful wildlife and, and clean water. Things that seem audacious to ask of a farm become possible. And I've seen it work across the US. I've seen it work in Kazakhstan and Malawi. And it's incredible because to look at a farm and to say to a person who feels nothing's working, we're going bankrupt. My children don't want to work here anymore. I don't want to work here. I'm being poisoned by, by, by what we are applying to the land. It is degrading at a faster and faster rate every year. And to pause and come back to, what do you need? What do you need? And for them to articulate it in ways that seem audacious and selfish, especially to, to their neighbors who go, you want your children to stay, none of our children stay. They all leave. I have seen farms and ranches uh, uh, restore ecosystems, improve the quantity and quality of the available water in their aquifer, increase biodiversity, 
grow the resilience of their regional food system and enhance the nutritional density of food, create equitable and joyous lives for agricultural workers, and transform atmospheric carbon into healthy soil. None of these things are possible if we don't start with that question, of what do I need? What am I willing to ask for? What am I willing to give as my gift of vulnerability to invite the vulnerability and relationship of, of others? So with just a final minute, because I'm, I'm an experiential person, I want you just to find a place of rest and repose. I would invite you to close your eyes if you'd like, or just gaze softly down. But imagine yourself in a forest. Imagine the quality of attention and appreciation and care that you bring when you're in this natural environment. In the man-made world, we are very quick to, to bring judgment and, and expectation, but something magical happens when we are surrounded by the sounds and the smells and the sensation of this living community. There's a sense of coming home, of acknowledging that we, like every living thing in that forest, are worthy of life and of love. We are constantly connected. And vulnerability is not something that weakens us, but instead connects us to that infinite force. And in this moment, of rest and acceptance. Just offer an invitation for that very quiet, innocent voice in, in you that knows what it needs to begin expressing itself. Could be a feeling, could be an image, could just be a request for you to do this at a different time when you're at home and you can journal, just make that invitation. And know that whatever comes up, you don't have to instantly act on it. It might be a strategy, might not be a need, might not be appropriate yet, or you might not have the resources there. But just take this moment with your heart open with the same curiosity that you bring to the forest to say, what is it that my heart is crying out for? Where can I build community beyond the confines of expectation? And just very slowly, you are welcome to open your eyes and come back. And so I will end with just a brief quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer who says, the person who is in love with their vision of community will destroy community. But the person who loves the people around them, including yourself, that's me, sorry, parenthetically, will create co a community everywhere they go. Thank you all. Thank you, Kevin. Our closing hymn is number 121 in the gray hymnal. We'll build a land.